This is barium carbonate containing the radioactive isotope of carbon, C14. We're going to use it for an investigation of certain aspects of photosynthesis. Before it's used, it's diluted by mixing it with some non-radioactive carbonate. Here's the mixture. Its radioactivity, it's a weak beta particle emitter, can be detected using a Geiger-Muller counter. Some of the mixtures placed in this flask, and by adding hydrochloric acid to it, we can liberate radioactive carbon dioxide gas. The acid will be added from here, onto the carbonate. And the gas coming off will pass along here, to a drying column, then round this tubing to a flow meter. There's the flow meter. and into a large glass vessel which acts as a mixing chamber. From there, it passes along behind to this, the experimental chamber, where we'll feed plant leaves with the radioactively labelled carbon dioxide. A peristaltic pump keeps the gas circulating. And there's the flow meter registering the rate of flow, only air at present, of course. Pea plants will be used in the experiments. We're going to feed this leaf with the radioactive carbon dioxide. We'll mark it with sticky tape. And you can see that it's not radioactive. This is just the normal background radiation. Now we put the plant in position. With the leaf, we're going to feed with radiocarbon sealed inside the experimental chamber. A lamp provides artificial sunlight. Now the acid is dropped onto the carbonate mixture. And carbon dioxide containing some molecules labelled with radiocarbon C14 is released. The gas circulates. And the lid of the fume chamber is partly closed in case any leakages occur from the apparatus. Photosynthesis is now taking place, the leaf assimilating carbon dioxide in the presence of light. Now, after a short time, we can take out the plant. There's the leaf we fed, and it's now radioactive, showing that it has assimilated radioactive carbon dioxide. The leaf now contains carbohydrate itself labelled with radiocarbon, made from the radioactive carbon dioxide fed to it. For the first experiment, we repeat what we've just seen, first of all feeding a leaf for just one minute. The leaf is then quickly cut off the plant and killed by plunging it into liquid nitrogen. It can now be ground into a powder. There it is. Then it's dissolved in hot ethanol. And it's transferred to a numbered vial. The experiment's repeated twice with two more plants. But the leaf in vial number two was allowed to photosynthesize for a further minute after removal from the experimental chamber, making two minutes in all. And that in number three photosynthesized for five minutes in all, including the one minute during which it was fed with the radioactive gas. 
These two vials contain fructose and sucrose solutions, respectively, each also labelled with radiocarbon for use as references. You can see that each sample is indeed radioactive. A drop of solution from each vial is now spotted onto a thin layer chromatograph plate like this. There are now five spots of solution, one from each vial. The plate is now placed in a tank of solvent, which will gradually soak up it, carrying with it various substances present in the five spots of solution. Different substances will be carried different distances up the plate, depending upon their molecular characteristics. This is the principle of chromatography. After several hours, the plate's removed. and the solvent's now allowed to evaporate. He's marking the level which the solvent had reached. The counter now shows that compounds containing radiocarbon have indeed moved up the plate from the positions of the original spots. We now make an autoradiograph. The plate's wrapped in thin plastic film, then it's going to be laid against a sheet of photographic film and left in the dark room for several days. Since the beta particles emitted by carbon-14 affect the photographic emulsion, we get this photograph of the radiation, called an autoradiograph. You can see how, as the solvent moved up the chromatograph plate, it carried up substances labelled with the C14. These first three large blobs are at the same height as the sucrose used as a reference, so clearly the leaves each produce this sugar from the carbon dioxide with which they were fed. Each also produced some fructose. This blob here is from the fructose reference solution. We can also see that the leaf which only photosynthesized for one minute produced little else but sucrose and fructose. But after two minutes photosynthesis, another leaf had produced something up here, probably some amino acids. While after five minutes, the blob at the top shows even more production of the same substances. This was just a simple demonstration. It's possible to use these techniques to investigate much more precisely the mechanism of the photosynthetic process. For example, with only very short periods of exposure to radioactive carbon dioxide, a few seconds or so, the Calvin cycle can be investigated. Now for a second technique using radiocarbon labelling. This time the leaf's fed with radioactive carbon dioxide for a longer time. For half an hour, in fact. The leaf's not cut off and the entire plant's going to be used. The roots are washed clean of soil. Then the plant's pressed and oven dried. It's wrapped in plastic film. Then it's left in the dark room, pressed against a photographic plate for several days. The result's an autoradiograph from the whole plant. You can see how, after 30 minutes feeding and photosynthesis, the leaf has become radioactive and shows up clearly. And there's been some movement of radioactive substances out of the leaf, especially to the apex where growth is taking place.
a smaller quantity has passed down the stem. But you can't see the leaves which were attached here because they've not taken up any of the labelled carbohydrate formed and very little has passed down into the roots. If we feed a leaf on another plant for 30 minutes, then allow it to go on photosynthesizing for another two and a half hours, although the same amount of labelled assimilate should have been produced as before, perhaps over this longer period, it will have been translocated to other parts of the plant. Yes, this has happened. There's a growing tendril picked out very clearly. And although very little more has gone into the lower leaves, as you can see, A lot has passed down into the roots, which now show up very clearly. Here's a pressed and dried, fully grown pea plant, one of whose leaves was fed with labelled carbon dioxide. This leaf was fed, and you can see how a lot of carbohydrate has passed up into the pod. Such autoradiographs tell us something about the organisation of assimilate transport within a plant. For a more quantitative investigation, we use yet another technique. The plant's fed, as before, through one leaf and allowed to photosynthesise for whatever time is required. Then it's cut up into its various constituent parts and dried. These are bits of root. Here are the leaves which were not fed with radiocarbon. These are the tips of the growing shoots. D is the leaf which was fed with radiocarbon. And E, the stem fragments. Weighed samples from each vial are oxidised completely in this combustion apparatus. The carbon comes off as carbon dioxide, which is absorbed in solution. The radioactivity of this solution will provide a measure of how much assimilate from the treated leaf has reached this part of the plant. The radioactivity is measured in a scintillation counter which works automatically, producing a reading for each sample in turn. From such readings, it's possible to work out accurately just how much assimilate has reached different parts of the plant in a given time. In the experiment booklet, you'll find some data produced in an investigation of this kind, from which you can make some calculations yourself. The booklet also gives some quantitative data from a chromatographic analysis for you to work on. Use the notes and problems in the booklet to learn as much as you can about these investigations of photosynthesis and assimilate transport.